We are today going to wrap up the book of Ruth without using a single verse from the book of Ruth, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, long, uh, about six weeks ago or so, we started this journey in the book of Ruth, and we talked about the context of the book of Ruth and how one of the unique parts of the book of Ruth is that the whole thing takes place within the time frame of the book before it. So if you look at your scriptures, you have a book called Judges and then the book called Ruth. And Ruth happens while that time period of the Judges is happening. And understanding what is going on during that time in the book of Judges is a massive, massive, important piece when it comes to understanding how unbelievable the context of Ruth is. The things that happen in Ruth are supernatural because they take place in this time period of the judges. And so we're going to talk a little bit this morning about what was going on around Ruth and Boaz and Naomi in Israel, and what can we learn from that? Because what we'll be able to see is that what, take, what, what took place in the book of Judges is very, very similar to our cultural moment here. And we have a huge opportunity in this cultural moment, if we'll seize it. And so if you go back to the book of Judges, what you'll find is this is a time of a downward spiral in Israel's national and spiritual life leading to chaos and apostasy. If you go into the book of Judges, and I would not read it with your children, it is a very, very disruptive book. Like, I, I'm, I'm serious when I say that. Do not read the book of Judges with your children, right? Go to John. It's better, right? It's better for their age, right? Go tell the story of Noah, but not the destruction part, right? Like, let them wrap their minds around who God is. But in the book of Judges, the people are on a downward spiral of wickedness. And they're revealing that they have a desperate need for a king. There is no king in Israel. And by the time you get to the end of the book of Judges, Israel has violated its covenant relationship with God in almost every single imaginable way. Matter of fact, Israel has violated its covenant with God in ways that you didn't even know it could be violated. They have taken their covenant relationship with God. They've taken Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua, and they've absolutely disobeyed and turned themselves away from all of it, all of it. And here's the pattern that happens in the book of Judges. Here's how it goes over and over. If you read the book of Judges, you would see this pattern. First thing that happens is the people abandon the Lord. The people abandon the Lord. And every time the people abandon the Lord, it breaks God's heart. And we miss that sometimes about God. We see the justice and we see his vengeance and we see him judge the people and we miss what often happens almost every time it happens throughout scripture is that God gets his heart broken. That he has a love relationship with his people, the way he wants a love relationship with us. And he wants to maintain that relationship. And every time the people abandon the Lord, just like us, every time you abandon God, every time I abandon God, it breaks God's heart. If you are a parent, you know this truth. Tell me, when your child abandons you, when your child disobeys your teaching, when your child lies to you, you may get frustrated, you may get angry, but you know where that's coming from? It breaks your heart. And so God feels that same way about his kids. And so what he does to try and bring them back into relationship is he often punishes them by raising up a foreign power to oppress them. He'll send in a foreign country to try and bring them back and wake them up. And oftentimes this happens for us too, right? We disobey the Lord. He chastises us or tries to get us back in right relationship. And then we do this. The people then cry out to God for deliverance, right? This is what we do. Like we do bad. God tries to do a course correction. That's painful, and we're like, oh, dear God, help me. I messed up again, right? And so we cry out and say, God, help me. God, help me. I, I get this in my office all the time. Like, how did my life end up here? Really? Like, we can go back and find out how it ended up here, right? 
We can walk the steps. And most of the time, it's something that we chose to do. And so they cry out for deliverance. And God, because he's so good, he's a good, good father, he raises up deliverers for them. In the book of Judges, he sends a judge. And they judge them. And they bring them back in right relationship. And then here's what happens with the people of Israel and happens with us. We repeat. Right? We go back to abandoning the Lord. We go back to being judged. We go back to crying out to God. God delivers us. Repeat. It's called a sin cycle. Now, you may wonder, why does this happen in the book of Judges? And why do we still do the same thing? There are two main reasons in the book of Judges this happens. Okay? And I want you not to miss these because this is what is happening around Ruth and Boaz and Naomi the whole time. The first reason this context happens. The first reason that there is apostasy and there is wickedness and there is chaos is because there's no king. There's no king in Israel. And believe it or not, leadership matters. Leadership matters a lot. And if we're talking about godly leadership, the absence of godly leadership matters a lot. Think about our country. Does leadership matter? Yes. What if we had godly leadership? It would matter. And there is no king in Israel to provide leadership. And when you have no leadership, it means you have no leader, you have no vision, and therefore you have no direction. The people of Israel have no idea what to do, where to go, and how to please God. They have no one pointing them in that direction. In the book of Judges, it says this over and over. Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 18, 1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Judges 19, 1. In those days, there was, where, when there was no king in Israel. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so here's what happens is when you don't have leadership, you don't have vision. And when you don't have vision, bad things happen. Simon Sinek, who's a leadership guru speaker, he says this, great leaders must have two things, a vision of the world that does not yet exist and the ability to communicate that vision clearly. The people of Israel have neither. They don't have anyone who can Tell them a vision of the world that doesn't exist, and they have no one with the ability to communicate it, even if they had the vision. And so here's what happens. They go wild. Proverbs 29 says this, if we have no vision, the people perish, King James. ESV 29 18 says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. If there is no vision from heaven, if there's no vision from God, from a great leader, the people cast off restraint. They just like, they go wild. They do whatever they want. The NLT is my favorite version of this. says, when people do not accept divine guidance, vision, they run wild. And what is happening around Ruth, Boaz, and Naomi this whole time is the people of Israel are running wild. They are chaotic. It is nuts. While they're having all these unexpected things happen within their circle, the world around them is chaos. This is what happens in Israel, and it also happens in our cultural moment. It happens in Peoria. It's happening in Illinois. It's happening in America. It's happening in the world. When you have no king, here's what everybody does. Everyone does that which is right, in their own eyes. And we know this is true. We have a country that is built on us doing what is right in our own eyes. You ever heard this? I have rights, right? I have rights. I have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when you get in the way of my happiness, you are violating my rights. It is our version of everyone does that which is right in their own eyes, because we are a people right here today, thousands of years after this story, we are a people with no king. We have no godly leadership. We have no vision for what could be and how to get there. Take this context. The people of Israel went through 400 years of slavery. They had nothing. They were slaves in Egypt. 
God frees them. They wander in the wilderness. They still have nothing. And so when they go in to take the promised land, what they were supposed to do is the people of Israel were supposed to go in the promised land and kick out all the pagan cities and countries. They were supposed to get rid of all evil and sin from their land. Now, they took a lot of it. If you look at a map before and after Israel goes in the promised land, they took a lot of it, but they left significant cities under Canaanite rule and reign. And so what happens is they are still surrounded by and entrenched with sin. And the people of Israel who've had nothing in their slavery for hundreds of years begin to look around at the Canaanite lifestyle and they think, hmm, that doesn't look too bad. You know, we, we just came out from having nothing. And God said, go in the promised land and we would have abundance. And so why not have some of their abundance too? You see, when Israel got into the promised land, they look around and the Canaanites had art, they had literature, they had architecture, they had trade, they had political organization, and much more. They looked and said, man, we were in slavery, we had nothing, and we come in here and we left some Canaanites and, and, and all the it, it, Isites and all those around, and they have some stuff that we kind of would like to have. It happens to God's people today. I'm serving God and I don't have. He's wicked and he has. Maybe I need to do what he's doing. Maybe I need to do what she's doing. It didn't stop there, though. Israel looked at their religion and wanted it too. And this is where perversion really comes. See, the Canaanites worshipped a god named Baal. And within that religious worship was sexual pleasure. They not only worshiped, but they also enjoyed sexual pleasure as an act of worship. They actually had these women called prostitute priestesses within their religion. And so the people of Israel look and they're like, we'll take your art, we'll take your literature, we'll take your architecture. We love that political organization. We like that kind of structure. That looks fancy and new. And oh, by the way, we can be religious and satisfy our sexual desires. Count me in. And when you go to the book of Judges, that's what you see. That the people of Israel abandon the Lord. How bad was it? I encourage you, if you're an adult, go read the story in Judges 19. There's a story there of a Levite and a concubine. It is so wicked, I wouldn't read it in here without asking you to dismiss your children. It's one of three or four stories that you're like, that's in the Bible? Yes. But once that story takes place in Judges chapter 19, here's what the people around the place say. It says, and all who saw this happen, all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt until this day. We should consider it, we should take counsel, and we should speak. The wickedness that happened was so wicked that the people of Israel said, man, it's never been like this before. Sound familiar? How many times have you heard on the news? How many times have you heard people in church? How many times have you heard politicians say, it has never been like this before? They often phrase it, and these are unprecedented times. They're not. They're not. They're the same thing we've been doing for thousands of years. But we see it, and it's wicked. In the midst of all this, we find the story of Naomi, of Ruth, and Boaz. A story, check this out, of God's goodness. In the midst of that cultural moment, we find a story that many of you have been enamored with, that you have emailed me with how much you've loved this series. Now, God is changing your heart and perspective on so many things. In the midst of it, we find God's goodness. We find God's redemption. We find God's royalty that he has planned for his people. And you know what else we find? We find kindness in the midst of it. And that's what we need to learn today. That's how we need to close out this journey together. 
that we live in similar times as the book of Judges. We live in a time where we see things that we can't believe we see. And not some like we see them, oh, up in Chicago, or we see them in L.A., or we see them in New York. No, we see them down the street, across the yard, in our neighborhoods, all of them. Not just the south neighborhoods or the west neighborhoods or the east neighborhoods, but all the neighborhoods. We see things in Dunlap that make us think, like, how do our kids have a chance? And you know what our opportunity is? It's to show unexpected kindness. We have an opportunity, Richwoods, to not be silent because that helps nobody. A bunch of people with the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again for your sin and loves you radically and wants to lavish grace on you, we should never be silent. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. We also should never be mean. There has to be somewhere in between. And what we find from the book of Ruth is that Ruth had unexpected kindness. Boaz had unexpected kindness. The neighborhood women around Naomi had unexpected kindness kindness, surrounded by chaos, apostasy, and wickedness. So what that means? We can have it too. And if we do, it can literally change people's lives. So how do we have that kind of unexpected kindness like Ruth and Boaz and Naomi have? That's what we're going to look at today. How do we live in the time of judges where there is no king in America And every man and woman does that which is right in their own eyes. How do we have unexpected kindness? The first thing we do is we have to have the right soil. We have to have the right soil of kindness. I love this definition of kindness. It's my favorite one. I've read tons of definitions of kindness. All of them are true, but here's my favorite. It's loaning someone your strength instead of reminding them of their weakness. That is kindness. Kindness is loaning someone your strength Instead of the other option, which is reminding them of their weakness. And I submit to you, this can can only happen. This will only happen. This will only take place in the midst of people who have had their hearts changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no reason for man or woman to loan their strength to someone weaker than them unless they are motivated by the gospel. There's no reason. There's no reason not to remind each other of their weaknesses so that we can advance unless you've had your heart changed by the gospel. God says in Ezekiel that what all of men and women need is a heart change. If you are in here this morning and you don't know Jesus, the biggest thing he'll do inside of you is he's going to change your heart. You are going to love things like you, that you never loved before. You are going to love in ways that you never loved before. You will be able to show a kindness that you never knew was possible because God will do a heart change. Here what it says, Ezekiel 11. When the people return to their homeland, uh, they will remove every trace of their vile images and detestable idols. Okay, Get rid of the sin. It only keeps you from kindness. You know one of the hardest things to do is be deeply stuck in your sin and be kind. It's almost impossible. Your addiction keeps you from kindness. Your anger keeps you from kindness. Your bitterness keeps you from kindness, right? He says, first, you got to get rid of those things, and I will give them singleness of heart, God says, and I will put a new spirit within them. Here's what he does. Here's the heart transplant. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart. That's how we have the right soil for kindness. That we have within us a stony, stubborn heart. Here's what a stony, stubborn heart is. It is a heart that is judgmental, is harsh, and reminds others of their weaknesses. It reminds others of their weaknesses, whether directly or indirectly. A stony heart, which you may have sitting here this morning, is judgmental and harsh and unkind, and knows why everybody else is wrong. A tender heart is responsive. It has compassion. It has patience. It gives strength to others' weaknesses. A tender heart feels what others feel, even if they've never experienced it themselves. A tender heart sees people 
before it judges people. So why are some people stony and some tender in heart? It's a great question. Why are some people stony and why are some people tender in heart? And I'll give you two reasons that I think are very possible. Reason number one is this. You haven't received the kindness of God. If you have a stony heart, you haven't received the kindness of God. That's reason number one. Because here's why your heart is stony. You cannot give what you have not received. You cannot give what you have not received. And if you have never received the kindness of God, then where does the kindness of God flow from? If you are unable to receive God's kindness on your life, then it is going to be so hard, if not impossible, to show kindness to a world in chaos and apostasy and sin. He says in uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 3, he reminds us of when we had a stony heart. He says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. You know what that was? Stony heart. That is a stony heart. But, it's one of my favorite words in Scripture. Number one, I can spell it. Number two, it changes everything. It changes everything. He says, you had a stony heart. You were captivated in malice and judgment and all kinds of that. You hated each other and they hated you. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, when his loving kindness appeared to us, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing, that's how intense it was, he needs to wash you of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, if you have a stony heart, if your heart is hard, if you have a hard time showing kindness, it could be that you have never received the kindness of God on your life. It may be you're resisting the kindness of God. Or reason number two, and I bet this is probably some of the room, we've forgotten about the kindness of God. Maybe you've received it, but your heart is getting harder by the day because you've forgotten about the kindness of God. You've forgotten how kind God was to you. You've forgotten how kind God is to you. You've forgotten how kind God is to you every single moment of every single day. And that is why your heart is getting harder towards other people by the second. Look at what he says in Ephesians 2. But God, go figure, right? being rich in mercy because of the great love which with, with which he loved us, check this out, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Like we have get stony hearts and we don't show kindness to other people, especially those in their sin, even though while we were in our sin, God's like, I love you. We, that's one of the hardest parts about Jesus. We walk, watch him walk around and have dinner and hang out with and recline with and enjoy a meal with and never yell at sinners. But he goes out in the square and who's he yell at? Religious people. There's not a sinner in your life who doesn't know Jesus that Jesus would yell at. There's not a sinner in your life that he would grab a bullhorn and stand on the corner and yell at them as they drove by to repent. He said, I love them. I loved you when you were a sinner. And we have to remember that. That God's love didn't come after I got saved. God's love didn't come after my baptism. God's love was always there. You just chose to receive it. He says, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. There's another reminder. You did nothing. All of us who are worshiping in here, you did nothing. Nothing to receive your salvation. He says, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is a cool thought to me, that in the coming eternal ages, when people look and say, hey, hey, Jesus, how is Chad here? Like, what a bum. Do you know how much sin he's done? Do you know how bad he screwed up that church? Do you know how terrible this, that, and the other? And Jesus is like, oh, I know all of it, and I covered it all with my blood. 
so that for the all of eternity, people will be able to look at you and me and say, there's the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness. It's measured by them that they are here. Right now, you are the immeasurable riches of his grace that you can stand here confidently and boldly and come to the throne of grace with your hands raised in your songs of worship. And so do you remember that? The rabbi Abraham Herschel said this, much of what the Bible demands can be comprised in one word, remember. Has your heart become stony because you forgot? Or maybe your heart's stony because you never knew or you never received. How's the soil of your heart? What are cultural moment needs? What are community needs? Is people with a heart of flesh. A people with a tender and compassionate heart then we have to act on it. And there is a simplicity of kindness that we have to recognize this morning. Kindness is not difficult. It is so easy to do, and yet so often we miss it. There's this really cool story in Acts chapter 28 where Paul is with a bunch of guys in a ship. They get shipwrecked. They get on the island. They learn that it's an island called Malta. And you know what they experience there? The simplicity of kindness. Read it with me. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness. Pretty good testimony for the rest of your eternity in the Bible, right? They showed us unusual kindness, and look what they did. You think, like, man, they had to give them a car. They had to give them a brand new mansion. They had to give them a stack of cash. Look what they did. They showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. Know this about unusual kindness. If you show unusual kindness and it comes from unexpected people, it will make a kingdom ripple. When unusual kindness comes from unexpected people, it makes a kingdom ripple. And believe it or not, we Christians have become the unexpected people. Believe it or not, people, especially outside the church, Do not expect us to be kind. Here's what they expect. Silence or mean. Because that's what they see on the news. They see us standing outside our house with an AR-15 and a flag. Or they see us cowering, saying nothing. So when you and I begin to take kindness of Jesus Christ to a world in chaos, they start to receive it as unexpected kindness from unexpected people, and it makes a kingdom ripple. This made such a kingdom ripple in Paul's life that it ends up in the pages of Scripture. And you know what the people of Malta did? They made a fire, and they didn't have to. Being kind is doing something you didn't have to do. James Berry says this, always be a little kinder than necessary. And that's what Malta was. The Malta people were a little kinder than necessary. Paul was there with his people. They don't know who they are. They did not have to build them a fire. They did. Why? Because they were a little kinder than necessary. And I was on the receiving end of this this week. A lady in our church sent me a text on Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember the day, but here it is. She said this, as you begin your day, don't forget your gifts. You are caring, you are kind, you are compassionate, and most importantly, you his. Have a great day. Oh, yeah, you're kind of funny, too. (laughs) Couldn't agree more. She could have said you're kind of handsome, too. That would have been better, but whatever. I'll take what I can get. And it had been inappropriate. My wife would have beat her up. Uh, Can you imagine Jenna getting in a fight? It's so funny. I can't even visualize it, right? Now, when this woman sent me this text, she didn't know that I was in the middle of studying 
for a sermon on kindness. God is just good that way. And she didn't know, which I could tell her right now, is that this text has been with me all all week. There hasn't been a day this week where I haven't thought, God, thank you for reminding me that I do care. Thank you for reminding me, God, that I can be kind. Thank you, for God, that someone thinks I'm compassionate. Thank you, God, for reminding me that I'm your son. Thank you, God, that I'm funny. Here's the point. What a ripple effect she made in my life. Her little text ended up in the sermon. The simple act of making a fire. The simple act of sending a text that says, you matter. It was an unexpected person doing unexpected kindness that made a difference in my life. Romans 12, verse 10 says this, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Imagine if we live this way. That instead of trying to gain honor, we began to live by trying to outdo one another. And because here's the beautiful part of that. Take it in your marriage, okay? Say you're married. If you, husbands, outdo your wife in showing honor, and she listens to Scripture as well and says, I'm going to outdo him in showing honor, what does that create? It creates a beautiful tennis match of back and forth. You trying to outdo one another in showing honor, and you both receive honor. God knew what he was doing. He's like, if you guys all go try and outdo other people in showing honor, you will also be on the receiving end of that. So go do simple acts of kindness because eventually they will be done for you. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul, from a prison cell, says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. You know why? Because it's easy, it's cheap, and everyone does it. If you're selfish, you're not unique. You're just like the rest of us. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Imagine a couple hundred people. We had over 300 and probably 50 people here in first service, 250 plus in second service, plus all our kids, right? Total attendance today will probably be above 900. Imagine 900 people going about, children and adults, saying, man, you are more significant than me. How do I bring you honor? It's culture-changing. It's not silent and it's not mean. It's simple. Robert Ingersoll said this, we rise by lifting others. And you know this is true if you've done it. There's something about it that wells up inside of you. Now they just didn't make them a fire. Do you see the second thing they did? They welcomed all. They didn't welcome Paul. They welcomed all. Every single man on that ship, they welcomed them all. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it's a powerful little verse. It says, honor everyone. Surely God didn't mean everyone. Everyone. I didn't write it. He did. Love the brotherhood. That's right here. Fear God. This last one really hurts. Honor the emperor. When Peter writes this, it is not a good emperor. It is not a godly emperor. He is evil. He is wicked. He is selfish. He does not care or love his people, and he hates Christians. And Peter writes a letter that says, honor the emperor. I'll let you apply that to America, however the Lord leads you to apply it. Right? But Scott Adams says this, there's no such things as small act of kindness. Every act creates a ripple with no logical end. No logical end. Do you think when I got that text that that young lady thought, man, this will do this and this will encourage him and then he'll share it with Jenna and then he'll tell this and then he'll put in his sermon and then the whole church will know about it. Yay, this is going to be awesome. No, she sent it and forgot about it. And I know she did because I know who she is but it had a ripple effect that kept going and going and going. Robin Sharma said this, every person who delivers kindness stays with us forever. It's why we have a value here called we welcome everyone. And here's what it means. We welcome every person with the boundless love and grace of Jesus. You know what that is? It's simple. It's simple. 
And all you have to do is remember, okay, how much love did I receive from God? How much? How much? Uh, Boundless. Thank you. I'm glad you're awake. Boundless. There was no shore of his love. It didn't come a certain length on the shore and stop. He lavished it upon us. How much grace have you received? Boundless. Boundless. And so we at Richwoods Christian Church, we say every person who walks in the door, we want to show the boundless love and grace of Jesus. It is simple and yet incredibly hard if we don't remember what we've received. Now, you know what this is going to require? It's going to require a shift toward kindness. We will all have to live different when we walk outside this door or at least begin the process. We're going to have to shift. George Eliot said this, and just in case you're afraid of change, it's never too late to be who you might have been. And I would say that to you if you're here this morning and you're 85 years old. It is never too late to be who you might have been. If you have not taken the dirt nap, then that means God still has a plan for you. God still wants you to be who he knows you can be. Dirt nap. I just came up with that off the cuff. It's not even in my notes. We'll take it, right? It's the best I got, right? It's never too late. If you're 14, it's never too late to be who you might have been. If you're 40s like me, and man, nothing has played out the way you thought, it's not too late to be the person you might have been. It's not too late. Something will need to change for us to bring kindness to this cultural moment. And I'm going to tell you why. This is so important. Because all of us are being pushed in a direction. Make sure you catch this. All of us in this room are being pushed in a direction towards anger, towards division, towards hatred, towards blindness, towards deafness, and towards paganism. And I can prove it to you through your social media feed. Your, you know why your social media, if you bring up, let's take Instagram, for example. You can take any of them. You know why your Instagram or Facebook or whatever you use brings up certain things? Because it knows that's what you want to hear. Five months ago, my Instagram was full of golf stuff, full of it. Golf videos, golf advertisements. You know why? Because I was playing a lot of golf and I bought a new set of irons. All right? And so every single time I get on, it's golf, golf memes, golf this, golf that. And I loved it because I love golf. Now, you know what my Instagram's full of? You should buy these running shoes. You should do this for a workout. You should eat this salad. You should make this dish. Why? Because I'm always talking about health and fitness because that's what's going on in my life, right? It's pushing you towards who you want to be. Your news station does the same thing. And it's doing it on both sides. We're so angry at each other on either side of that thing, and we're actually doing the same exact thing. If you're on this side, you know what it's telling you? That side's evil. And you know what this side, the blue side's being told? They're evil. And you know what it creates? Division, not kindness. You are being pushed that way. And the only way to stop it is to push back. Is to say, I'm not a pawn in your game. I'm not just that. If you pull up your social media or you watch the news, are you listening to any other alternative options? Are you listening to the other side? Are you listening to another person's perspective? We say that we are, man, we are no longer a Christian nation. I submit to you, I don't know that we ever were. I don't know that we ever were. Just because something is called Christian doesn't mean it is Christ-like. Right? If we were so Christian, then why did certain people not allowed to go to the bathroom with me? Why were certain people not allowed to eat at my table? Why were certain people beat and lynched and mobbed and thrown in prison for no reason? If we were so Christian, then why was that the case? We tortured them, and then we went to church. And we raised our hands. 
And we were pushed that way instead of being pushed towards kindness. And the people that stepped up, white, black, and every other, stepped up with kindness. You know why Martin Luther King Jr. is so beautiful? Because he did it with kindness. The Apostle Paul. Our city needs kindness. It needs real supernatural kindness from unexpected people. The Apostle Paul said to do this, we have to, we have to change. In Colossians chapter 3, he lays out this list. You can look at it on your own. Verses 5 through 9, he says, I need you to put to death some things. In verses 10, he says, I need you to put on new life. And in verses 12 through 17, he says this, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. He tells us, God's chosen ones. If you are a son or daughter of God, this is a message to you. Put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Put it on. As 2024 comes, put it on. As there's a debate on the news, put it on. Put on kindness, put on humility, put on meekness, put on patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. And above all these, oh, we know this verse and it's so hard to live, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We need to shift what we're doing, Richwoods. This isn't a message for every church in the area. This is what God has for us right here because I believe he's calling us to go be the kindness this city needs. Abraham Maslow said this, in any given moment, we have two options. To step forward in growth or to step back into safety. And this is what's happening right here this morning. You can either choose the option of, I need to grow. You may be an incredibly kind person, but could you be humble enough to be able to say, I need to grow in my kindness. I need to grow in how I listen to our culture and community. I need to grow on the sources of information that flood my life. Or will you step back into safety? And here, let me just submit to you why I think some of us will. For sure, some people will leave here and you will step back into safety because you're afraid. Because deep down, you're afraid to listen to people who aren't like you. You are afraid of others' perspective. You are afraid that you might have something wrong. You are afraid that you may have to confess something or rid something from your life. I love what Maya Angelou said, it takes courage to be kind. It takes courage, Rich Woods to be kind. It takes courage to evaluate our life and say, if Ruth, Boaz, and Naomi, surrounded by chaos and apostasy and sin and wickedness, can show us the unexpected kindness of God, then we can too. But you know what Ruth had to be? Courageous. You know what Boaz had to be? Courageous. You know what Naomi was? Courageous. Our city does not need God's people to be silent. And it has enough of God's people being mean. It needs us to be kind. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I love you. You are the kindest person I've ever known. You have shown us grace and mercy and love that is unbelievable. I pray, God, that you will help us to remember. Remember when we were lost and without hope in the world. Remember when we were without Christ. Remember when we were blinded by the prince of the power of the air. Remember, help us to remind us when we couldn't see the gospel, when we couldn't see the the God that you are. And 
then you opened our eyes to behold wondrous things from your word. You opened our eyes to the truth. You opened our eyes to love, and it's made all the difference. I pray that hundreds of people today from these two services and online will go with tender hearts, showing simple acts of kindness that will have a ripple effect on the kingdom and that we will continue to be learners and shift our minds and our hearts toward being Christ-like, not just called Christian. Help us to be like you in the public place. Help us to love you deeply in the secret place. And thank you for the journey with Ruth. And she showed us what it means to have unexpected kindness in the midst of a world gone crazy. I pray that we will live it out. In Jesus' name, amen.